Welcome to the Documentary Talk podcast, where we will discuss and learn about documentaries. My name is Domingo Payne. Thank you for joining me. On this first podcast, I'll be joined by my good friend, Juan Castro. He'll be phoning in from Sacramento. He is a longtime friend, a childhood friend from Sacramento, California. He's also an avid documentarian, if you want to call him that. So we will discuss the documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, It's a documentary which covers the 13th Amendment, its impact on the African-American population and incarceration in the United States. I will add a small disclaimer here. In a discussion of a documentary, there are many themes involved and many topics covered. Some of those topics can be politics, could be religion, could be others, and each person that's involved in the discussion comes with their own background and their own point of view on things. None of the opinions or thoughts that are brought up are necessarily the viewpoint of the Documentary Talk podcast. Documentaries do promote open dialogue and oftentimes push back against any preconceived ideas you might have had or you may have, but that's what's great about documentaries. I also want to offer a small apology here because the recording quality of this first podcast isn't the greatest. Uh, We are learning and we definitely will get better. If you're a podcaster or just a person who's listening in and have some thoughts or suggestions to offer us on how to improve, please don't hesitate to contact us and let us know. You can email us at docutalkpodcast at gmail.com and offer any suggestions that way. You can visit our blog documentarytalkpodcast.wordpress.com and leave a comment. Or you can visit our Facebook page, Documentary Talk, and join us. And that would be great. So thank you for listening. And now the Documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay in a conversation with my friend Juan Castro. So what's going on? How are you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm doing good, man. We didn't really have a chance to talk about that documentary and I thought, oh, it would be a good conversation to to uh, put on the podcast because my plan is just to put any conversations. I have another friend. Um, he's in uh, Gilroy, and he's all into documentaries as well. So I said, hey, I tell him, I was telling him about what you were doing, and I was like, yeah. So I was talking to my friend, and he was talking about putting up a Facebook page for documentaries. And then I thought about doing a podcast because I used to do podcasts before, and I'm doing a new one. And I thought that would be cool to do a podcast on documentaries, you know, documentary talk. And um, and he's exactly. like, you know, at some point, we'll figure out um, if we get more people involved, you know, how to do like a watch party and everybody kind of talk about the documentary and what they thought about it. That would be fun. I've already there's a few people I already know who are pretty like my family and my family immediate family that I've talked to, and they're kind of like, you know, they're excited about it too because it's just it's just a neat, you know, one of the things about documentaries, especially if they're done well. Yeah, you know what I mean. They just they really kind of spark an interest in, in whatever the topic is. And so I wanted to talk about 13th. You know, I was just kind of wondering from a, perhaps, you know, from your perspective, what did you think about, you know, the way that the prison industrial complex is kind of perpetuating slavery? What is your take on that? So I see it as humanity. Right. Uh, human right. rights uh, violation. And uh, it was just done in such a sneaky way. And, you know, I think the South... They were trying to, to, to um, you know, get the economy back on track down in the South. They started, uh, you know, I think just back talk, talk, you know, behind closed doors started to place. And, you know, they were looking for ways to help get the economy in the South. And they had, they were lacking um, manpower, but they had a lot of people there. And, you know, they started creating all these laws to just create manpower to work them just to kind of reestablish slavery. They're a new, a new name, you know what I mean? And that's, how, I kind of wondered why things like marijuana, why are they working so hard to keep from being legalized, but now I'm starting to see that they needed manpower in a hurry, you know? There's so many people who smoke marijuana, it's easy to just enslave those folks, right? And uh, the more laws they have, the easier it is to throw people behind bars, trying to create a quick labor force. 
Yeah, and if you're a part of the population, lower economic class, you don't have a lawyer necessarily or the money to mount to legal defense, then it's likely you're going to, uh, if you get caught with some marijuana and you have money, it's going to, you know, it's going to be some kind of small slap on the wrist. But if you're from lower uh, socioeconomic background, you're probably going to go do some time. And uh, yeah. yeah, so this, that is a way to get that labor force that you need to do that in the prison system. I was thinking about how that ties in and just how it's been so, you know, so a thing that, and I, and I used to, like, when I was growing up, I didn't like marijuana, and I was really, like, anti, you know, marijuana and marijuana users. I thought they were, I thought the, actually that the marijuana made them dumb or something. And at the same time, at some point, you know, I started drinking alcohol, never thinking twice about that, realizing over time, oh, you know what, more people do really stupid stuff drinking alcohol than smoking weed even though i don't like it maybe i didn't like you know i didn't like the smell or uh and being around people that were high so uh and that's when i started questioning it and wondering about you know i was like in my 30s before i started like reading up trying to figure out anything about marijuana the more i realized you know i don't really remember anyone really doing anything in the news or anything like that I was like oh the suspect was drunk or he was doing cocaine, or he had marijuana in his system along with cocaine, heroin, you know, or some other kind of stuff. And so I started thinking about it. Maybe it's not necessarily uh, – because I started thinking about also about I – I also avoid taking any medications, some Vicodins or something like that, because I'm paranoid. And then I started finding out uh, – I had friends and family members that – also had an injury or a surgery and were prescribed Vicodin. And, and I found out through no research that they are highly addictive, along with, uh, you know, Oxycontin, a lot of other drugs. And like, yeah. well, we prescribe those. Those aren't illegal. But why yeah. is marijuana illegal? And just realized it was just a weird social thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched a few documentaries and I didn't uh, read anything about it. But, I, you know, uh, yeah, they, they started to, it was down in the South, actually. They, uh, and they, they actually classified it as a, a class A or class one drug, you know what I mean? Like it's worse than heroin. It's yeah. classified as one of the worst drugs. <laughs> right, And right. they started doing a lot of um, propaganda, you know, anti or propaganda against it, you know what I mean? Talking about how they were, I don't know. It was, it was just, to me, it's, it's, it's a drug that I think it was, it, it's used for depression. I think it's, it, you know, I'd rather see someone smoke a lot of marijuana than hurt someone or hurt themselves yeah and, you yeah. know uh, you kind of got to consider what, where, what state of mind are they in you know and I, that's what a lot of people you know don't agree with legalizing marijuana but I just think sometimes especially when you're growing up and you're going through a lot of you know emotional uh, you know what I mean ups and downs uh, you don't know what state of mind that kid's in and what he's doing with the school right. and you know what I mean and what if he needs you know some kind of you know, uh, psychological uh, escape. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and marijuana is like such a lightweight drug in comparison to some of these other drugs. And it may be a gateway drug, but then maybe it's not. But would you rather see him do that than hurt themselves or hurt someone? Yeah, you know and I, mean? I think that and, gateway drug thing is, is nonsense. More, more people start with alcohol, and you might as well yeah. call alcohol a gateway drug. But alcohol is even worse to me. I, oh, I've, I've seen oh, people, yes. they've, they've had affairs on their family, you know what I mean? And, oh, yeah. and it's always that excuse. Alcohol is always that label that like women and men will use to be able to, to sleep with someone else, you know what I mean? Oh, to yeah. have an affair on their spouse or whatever. And I've, I've seen it. Oh, yeah. And they won't even be that drunk. They just, oh, well, I was drinking, you know what I mean? That's their way of escape. And, yeah. And yeah, yeah you... Oh, man. Yeah, people, I mean, drunk, drunk driving, you know, people kill so many. I think it's, I don't know how many deaths per, per year off of alcohol. And, you know, the violence growing up, seeing all the violence associated with alcohol. I just realized, like, whether I personally have a use for it or not doesn't mean it, it someone else shouldn't use it. When I know, you know, looking at the research, it doesn't really harm people. If it does, it certainly doesn't harm people as bad as a lot of things that are legal and, yeah. you know, and a lot of other things. And I thought about it too. It's like anytime I walked into a store, like a convenience store, and there was a couple guys behind me or two or three or four guys, and they're drunk. 
and they're coming in. You got to watch your back. You know, you're like, okay, these guys are wasted. Let me be careful here because you know, and, oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. If, yeah, and if two or three guys come in and they smell like marijuana, I, I might not like the smell. But what I'm thinking, I'm just laughing. Look at these guys. They're gonna go grab a bunch of chips, and <laughs> you know, exactly. and, and I'm not exactly. worried. I'm not worried that anything's gonna happen that would hurt anybody. So, yeah. so um, one of the things I think that with their team the movie or the documentary is I think their reasoning behind all these, you know, breaking these laws, right? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you know, you start taking away, you just, they're, they're creating reason to enslave, to create manpower, therefore to, you know, benefit corporate America or even the world now. I mean, it's not just corporate America. Anybody could hire the, the prison, you know, American prison system to, make all kinds of things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it was, it's, it's like really cheap manpower. It's like going to a third world country, but yet you're not giving these jobs. They're just putting the money back into their pockets because it's like pennies. It's even cheaper than third world country. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Than hiring yeah. someone from the third world country. I mean, they're getting paid like a few cents an hour. Yeah. And, you know and, what I'm saying? and they're being punished already by being separated from society. You know, they're being incarcerated. I mean, they're in a cage and you know, again, the charges or whatever they might be doing time for can be stuff that's really minor and they can be doing a year or more. And that's of your life, uh, separated from society in a cage. And on top of that, then now they're going to make you labor for virtually nothing. You know, and it really questions like the whole point of incarceration. How could it be that the incarceration is supposed to, okay, you have a debt to pay to society. Okay, you're going to give a, a, a year of your life up because you had a marijuana joint or whatever. And then on top of that, where's the rehabilitation at? It's just focused on punishment or you, using you for labor. So it's really, the documentary really kind of points that out as, you know, yeah. this kind of just this ready made labor force that's really just taking advantage of our citizens who are supposedly oh um, serving their debt to society, right? Yeah. Pretty incredible. That's and true. then you look at the way they um, treat cocaine with those populations that they're targeting, in this case, African-Americans, you know, so it's like, oh, you have this form of cocaine called crack. You know, they pass these harsh laws. So every time you have a crack rock, you know, they're trying to give you a year or whatever it is in prison versus someone who might be from upper middle class and might have a bag of cocaine in powder form. And he goes to court. He has a lawyer. You know, they put him on probation or something like that, right? It's it's really crazy because it's the same drug. It's the same drug. But yet one one form is being treated much more harshly because they want to target that population. Yeah. yeah no, I, oh, my gosh. Totally. And what they're doing, too, they wonder why, you know, they, they haven't they're being so challenged. You know, they're having such a, a problem with, you know, these young men, right? with, you know, obeying the law. And, and this is the problem. They are fatherless. There's no disciplinarian in their lives, no male influence, you know what I mean? Uh, and right. and the, the only, the, the male influence that they had in their lives has been taken by them. You know what I mean? So they don't want to listen, and yet, you know, and this is something I think that, that needs to be taught in school. You know, I, I saw actually a video of it on Facebook one time about how you, what you do, when a car pulls you over. And I think it actually needs to be taught in school now. I think kids need to know what to do if a cop pulls you over. You know what I mean? That's something you should be taught. And it's something you usually just learn from your parents, but if your parents aren't there, yeah. how can they be taught that? And with that you know, system... Your father's in prison. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Yep. And, and your mom's going to school to try, you know, because she's going to lose her welfare if she doesn't get a job. But your father's in prison, so your mom's in school. She's going to, you know, going to school trying to make some of her life. So who's going to teach them how to the school? Their right. school that they go to? Well, you know, no one's taught them anything. And they're mad at the system for destroying their family. Yeah, right. Generation so, after you know generation. I mean? Man, it's just a catch-22. It's like it's a circle of defeat. And, you know, and it's never going to get better until we get rid of the lobbyists because the lobbyists, are going to make money because, you know, they, a lot of them have taken over the prison system. Oh, it's big you know business. I mean? It's huge. Yeah, it's a money, huge dude. business. Yeah. All money. I mean, we look at all the and, stats. We build, in California, we build more prisons than we do schools, right? Colleges. Obviously, there's money there. They wouldn't be building those prisons, right? Then they have to, they haven't, they're incentivized to, to uh, fill those prisons. 
Because if the prison's not filled, it's not uh, viable. You know, they're going to say, why is this prison even here? So the incentive yeah. is to continue to fill them prisons up. You got to you got to figure out ways. You know, obviously people are going to do things wrong, but you got to make sure that there's people to put into those prisons one way or another. So you make harsher laws. You target a certain population. It definitely is not going to be the Check people. Out, Mingo. We have, we have natural disasters that take place all year. Right. We have firestorms. We have flooding. Oh, yeah. So you need a certain amount of manpower, cheap manpower, to help combat these natural disasters. Not just right. that, but you also have uh, orders coming in from now corporate America, but now since the light has been shed on like Walmart, JC Penney's and different places, not Walmart, they do a lot of their stuff, you know, but they were a big part of that that lobbyist group. I know that the I can't even remember what it was called. Well, I'm sure they got the lobbyist. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, you know, something needs to be done, but I think it's, you know, how we actually, the only way we can defeat this, we can't defeat it politically. Politics is already, it's already been established. Now, we can start a third party here, but the best way to defeat it is as the consumer. We find out, you know, we find out who is benefiting from all these back. You know, back yeah, you follow the money. You follow the money. Um, and you follow the money. Yeah, and you're, but you're dead on when you're talking about getting rid of lobbyists or getting rid of, basically getting rid of money in politics. And this has come more to the forefront. People are more aware that this is the underlying problem. All these problems. And 13th, they're talking about this problem. And there's racial issues. But even that problem and all these problems, the underlying factor that would help mitigate or maybe eliminate the problem is the money in politics, the lobbyists and stuff like that. You take that out and you have less incentive to have this big industri- prison industrial complex building these prisons and trying to fill them up and target that population because there wouldn't be money in it. It wouldn't be a big business. So again, that's just another thing that is continued and encouraged because of so there's so much corruption because of all the money getting thrown into politics. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, or, you know, I think maybe if we just did prison reform, it's like a lot, of, one of the biggest problems with our prisons, you know, I think some of, people still need to go to prison when they make mistakes, even for work doing to a certain degree, okay, but you don't tear them away from their family, I think you figure out a way to create communities where families can live together and have a drug-free environment, and, you know, you, you get these men and these families learn to learn how to love each other, to love the idea of family. Yeah, no one I, understands what that is anymore. And see, that's why I was kind of having issues with my own my faith, my own religious faith, because you know a lot of uh, people in our in my religion believe in homeschooling. And one of the one one of the most beautiful things about the Christian church, I think, is families that that you know are you know uh, are within the church. Uh-huh. You know, the families stand out. And they usually stick together. Your family can usually make it, you know. And so you go to school and you see a kid with a whole family, that stands out. See, by them holding their children, they're holding the fruit that God is dangling on. You know what I mean? Say, hey, yeah. this, is, this is something that can be established. And, and I would you, say... You can, and I would say even like, you know, a Christian or a non Christian, um regardless, you know, yeah. regardless yeah. at one point at some you know, at some point uh, you get money out of politics and all that good stuff and at some point though I think the prison system will be re- redesigned or revamped because you're right. You're tearing yeah. families apart and that ultimately helps us destabilize and make society worse off. You know, so that's not that's not a rehabilitative um, move. There, it is just to incarcerate and to punish and focus on punitive sentences. Because people are just trying to to work and and you know, kind of help their family, trying to come out on the better end. You know, I mean, that's part of American history. You know, people who are you know have established their families. You know, kind of help build wealth within their families. You know, uh, they've actually usually went into the criminal underworld to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, entire community, the Italian community, the Irish community. I mean, every community that's come into this country has used the criminal element, you know what I mean? Kind of went through the criminal waters to kind of, you know, help establish their communities. And they, you know what I mean? They've kind of, they've built, they've branched out. 
you know. Um, yeah. yeah, and and what's interesting about that is, yeah, definitely because you can look back through history and see a lot of that. And what happens is, as communities begin to thrive, no matter how they got there, they tend to be, be less involved in crime and start to eventually go legit, as they say. You know, uh, a businessman uh-huh. who came to this country. Uh, you know, you can think of of uh you know any wave or any any wave of immigration and they came and they're involved in whatever whatever manner that is possible to make ends meet and to make money and to have a business and probably do things that aren't necessarily legal but eventually through prosperity it usually the community as it does better is um is encouraged to not be involved in crime and things like that because they start to stabilize and they t- start to uh say oh we can do this legitimately now we have enough capital or we have enough built up to be able to pay whatever is necessary to run exactly. run a uh, legitimate business and to do well um as far as the 13th amendment when they talked about it did, were you aware at all that it had the way that had that language in there to allow uh, the prison populations you know to be treated as slaves were you, were you, yeah, I wasn't yeah, really it was, aware of it was, It's the 13th Amendment, and it, it brought the freedom to slaves, and yet they accept, and there were conditions. Unless, you know, criminals can't be treated as slaves. And boom, it started in the South. Right. It, just, it really did. It's, that whole criminal, you know, uh, you know, prisons just started growing right after the Civil War like crazy. Yeah. And it was mostly black folks. And, it, you know, they, they would imprison so they wouldn't vote. They would put them in prison for just... This, this, the saddest thing, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so sad that this is, this has actually happened. And it, it's, I don't think it is a color issue anymore. I don't. But I do believe it started out that way and it stayed that way for decades. Um, now I believe, I think it's multiracial and I think it would get, they would gain a lot more ground if they would start being more inclusive, you know, uh, of like this Black Lives Matters and stuff like that I do because I think, you know, it's not just, I mean, last year, White people were killed by by the hand of police. More white people were killed by the hand of police last year. Now, well, hold on, hold on. You're saying you're you're saying more white people were killed by police yeah, than yeah. black people. There were more people last year, uh, white people that were killed by the hand of police last year than there huh. were. But black well, people. also, I, and I I wasn't aware of that. Um, but yeah. also the population is different though. There's more, you know, there's more, the, obviously the African-American, the black population is a smaller percentage of the overall population. So that would, so that would kind of lead to more Caucasians being, you know, having some involvement with police, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that trying to, I think they're kind of undermining their own movement by trying to vilify the police. I guess I do. I think the police are just a product of their own environment. I mean, you think about it. When you start out as a cop, you're not going to start out thinking you're going to be this, this like, uh, like a you know, a criminal yourself, kind of mean and, and just full of hate. You start out thinking you're going to want to change the world, but being in, you know, around that kind of environment every day, day in and day out, it's just going to change you, and it's going to transform you into this mean, judgmental, ill-willed, you know what I mean, not the world person. It's not, you know, it's just, they're just a product of their environment, just like the people that they're pursuing. They're just a product of their environment. So to, to start vilifying the police, I think that's just kind of a wrong idea. I well, think, I would know, say, I would say, you know, it, it depends because you're going to have some segment of any group that's protesting that goes extreme. Um, I don't think a lot of the group is vilifying the police, you know, because to say, you know, that all police are bad, I don't think is true. And I don't think that's really the statement. Uh, you know, I think, though, there are those police who are corrupt and they should be held accountable just like any other person oh, totally. should be. And, and actually, their fellow police officers should be holding them accountable. I and agree. I, and I think that's the that's the question. I mean, obviously, when when uh, there's, a, there's a show's perfect because there's just it's called the 5 or 750. And it's a, a Showtime documentary. They have two really good documentaries that you really need to see. One's about the CIA and the other one's about um, police corruption in New York. Yeah. And it's about these cops. Oh my gosh, man. I mean, they, they profess how bad this whole department got. Right. But, now check this out. You know, you kind of need a criminal element in your police department, right? To kind of, I'd rather have a police officer running our streets who can kind of get an idea about where the violence is, you know what I mean? Kind of escalating who to pursue instead of not knowing anything. Yeah. And it's yeah. weird because I actually played a video game about that, man. 
<laughs> really? Stupid. I, I learned the lesson off of the video game. Playing it was PlayStation 4, and it was it, it was a military game, but it became a, um, oh gosh, they had, it was a police game, right? And I'm sitting there, and at the end of the game, right, this guy, is a, he's a police captain, and he goes, I tried, I was legit just like you. But I realized I couldn't get anywhere unless I became a part of that element, a part of the criminal you know, element. I, I had to, in order to change the streets, I had to become the streets. I had to run the streets. And it was just kind of blew me away. It became like, you know, it was just this really well to guy. But especially in Florida, because of how bad, you know, it was in Florida for so long, you know, was, you know, that's where that was kind of like the landing strip for all the cocaine coming into America. You know, yeah. over on the east yeah. side, you know, so. I was reading something, though, about this, um, you know, more uh, whites or more blacks shot by police. And it's it looks like um, there were more whites shot in 2015. But if you adjust for population, it says unarmed black Americans were five times as likely to be shot and killed by police officers. So you're looking at the, okay. the, the ratio because of the percentage. But, you know, I think okay. I think ultimately... I think everyone has a right to protest um, peacefully and, and there's social issues that need to be addressed and police abuse of power is definitely one of them. And, but my thinking on that is that we have to understand that policing is a social component that we need or needed um, and maybe yeah. need. But perhaps, again, like a lot of things, I think it's outdated. I just think, you know, when someone goes off to um, fight in war and they do a tour or two, we know that there's long-term consequences of that, uh, PTSD. Yeah post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that, um, that they need help counseling. Well, when you're a police officer and you're in, especially when you're in a, you know, a, an area of poverty and high crime, you are in a, uh, you are in a combat situation. And I don't think it's, yeah. it's good for any one person to be in that situation too long. I mean, you have your people that are action junkies. I get that, but I don't know if they're always the best ones to be out there anyway. But, uh, in any case, you need time off. I think, you know, someone goes out, they're a police officer on the beat for a year, they need time off. They need to go and be totally doing, doing a cold case files or doing some kind of uh, desk work. I wouldn't even do it for a year. I would do it a few months out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Every few yeah. months, like a fire, like the fire. Uh, yeah, because we're human. We're all, we're, we're all human. And, and seeing death and carnage on a constant, you know, uh, basis and then being involved in high stress, life or death situations, it takes its toll on every person and police officers are human and we're not looking at it right. I think we need to look at it more as a social need to police, but police people, uh, police persons are human and they also have needs, even if they're not willing to say, Hey, I need, you know, help. Uh, and, but we need to, to treat it like that. Like you have your time out in the field. And then you have your time away from the field to get counseling and also to work on other types of police work that aren't involved, that aren't necessarily involved with uh, life or death situations and things like that. Like a part of their training should involve uh, spending time with kids in low poverty areas, you know, oh, yeah, even like sure. um, charity work where, you know, we have the Brothers and Sisters Club, you know, uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters Club. They, there should be some that should be part of mandatory for them to do work with kids who are, you know, what do you call it? I'm trying to remember the word for it, but, you know, uh, are um, high risk. Yeah. You know, that, so they can get used and kind of have some heart for these kids. Right. You know, and kind of, kind of get an idea of where these kids are coming from because if they're high risk, it's usually because of the, what they had gone through. Right. You know, and so if they could see these kids, seeing these kids first, you know, before they see them as criminals, then I think it'll, it won't, you know, they won't be so quick to kill. You know right. what I mean? Like that one police officer who shot that dude, that, that, uh, guy when he had a child. That's the only time I really, that was the one thing that bothered me more than anything. Some yeah. of these other times though, when you hear a cop saying stop. Right. Look at stop. Just stop. And I don't care. They're shot because they didn't stop. That's it. And then you guys are trying to wrestle a gun from them and all that. That's just, just stop. Now, that dude who shot that, that, that kid in the front and that dog, kid was in the back seat. I don't care. You don't take the shot. You know, yeah. You're taking a chance of shooting a kid. There was a kid in the freaking car. I don't care. That dude should go to jail. Yeah, see, I wasn't, I wasn't even aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. So this one I wasn't yeah. aware of. Wow. Yeah, there was one where there was a kid in the back seat and the girlfriend was up front. She was all upset because they shot the, the, the dude in front 
with a kid in the car. Yeah. And it could have been Cam shoot house. Even though he was just pulling out his permit or whatever, I guess, his gun permit or whatever. And still, I mean, oh man, it just... Well, the one that bothered me was uh, the Tamir Rice one, the kid that was in the park playing with the pellet gun. I mean, oh my God, when you see the dude, video, they man. just drove up and jumped out and just, you know, it seemed like when there was a kid with a gun, yeah, that's a risk, but you could have took a little more time through a bullhorn and said, hey, what are you doing? You know, put it, put it down from a distance. Um, there was no, I don't think there was anyone else around that, you know, if he did have a gun, if, if uh, they would have got shot, but it looked really like... They took no time at all to think about anything beside uh, the kids in the park with the gun. He's 12 years old, right? And they jump out and shoot him, like, immediately. That one really, that one bothered me a lot. Yeah, that, that bothers me, too. That does, because... The whole thing is, the whole thing is out of whack. But I think it's also, like, or like I was saying, it was it's a lot of um, a system that's outdated. You know, we need to upgrade a lot of things, I think. And that's why we keep running into problems in a lot of yeah. different areas. But, um... Hey Juan, I appreciate talking about this this documentary. Do you have any uh, suggestions for upcoming ones or anything? I don't, not yet. I, I love this one though. I don't know what to actually. Are we going to do like a, a like a thing on there where we we comment on on a certain one maybe, or is that how you want to do it at first? Yeah, however, hey, like, you got any ideas, content? man? Yeah, any whatever you think, you, you can let it roll and and let's see how it goes. I mean, yeah. We do. Can you actually post a video of what your comments are, maybe? We can even do that, right? Today, oh, that's you know, a good idea. We're in the comment section. Maybe we could do that. I'm not sure, but, you know. Uh, I like that. that. It's going to be fun. I think it'll be fun. I, I'm actually enjoying just talking about it. I, I, I love documentaries, man. I really, like I said, I, I really do. So, all right, Lingo, it was good talking to you, brother. Hey, it was good bye. talking to you, Juan. All right, man. All right, man. We'll talk soon. All right, bye. Okay, bye. Bye.